Hello and welcome back to the Archeria Pigments 3 tutorial series. In the last episode we were introduced to the Wavetable engine and today we're going to have a look at the various modulation options. I'm going to throw everything away and get back to a really simple default sound. So here we have a nice simple sine wave. Now we've got four different categories of thing that we can do to this sine wave. Let's deal with frequency modulation first, often abbreviated to FM. What we're going to do here is we're going to use a modulator, this thing over here, which is currently set to a sine wave itself, to change the frequency of the original wave. Now, in these terms, our basic wave, the thing that we're hearing, is called the carrier. And here we have our modulator. And typically, you can't hear the modulator. You see the volume is turned all the way down. And this is why the wavetable having its own volume is significant, because we can actually mix these two things together. Here's our original sine wave. I turn the volume of the wavetable all the way down. We've got nothing. I turn the volume of the modulator up. We've got a new sine wave. That is not the same sine wave. Let's turn it into a triangle. There's our modulator. There's our carrier we can mix them together. And now you're hearing a sine wave and a triangle wave as represented in the oscilloscope. But more often than not, you'll find that the modulator's turned down, the volume is turned down to zero. It's acting purely as a modulator on the carrier. I'm going to set it back to sine wave. I'm going to hold C down and I'm going to begin to introduce this modulation into the primary wave, see what it does to the shape. So what it's doing there is something that's pretty complicated to explain. So have a think about this for a moment. These waves are cycling at, what, 130.8 cycles per second. So the modulator is actually going backwards and forwards or cycling 130 times a second. It's having an effect on the carrier. Well, what, what's it doing? Well, 130 times a second, it's speeding the carrier up and slowing it down, speeding it up and slowing it down. If we were able to reduce the number of um, oscillations dramatically, sufficiently low to get down into LFO territory five or ten times a second, you'd hear it as a vibrato. But at this speed, you, you don't hear that. You don't hear the individual oscillations. You just hear an overall effect. <laughs> What's happening when I turn this modulation knob up is that the amount of modulation that's being applied to the carrier is being increased. The frequency of the modulator isn't changing. That's always 130 hertz when I press that key. If I press a different key, the modulator is now modulating at a relative rate to the key. That's because we're in relative mode. We'll get to the mode shortly. But that's just one modulation type. If I switch to white noise instead, you get a completely different effect. You see it now looks fuzzy. Because what's happening is that it's no longer oscillating um, backwards and forwards, increasing and decreasing the speed of the carrier smoothly. It's no longer operating um, as a sine wave. White noise is basically random. So now it's randomly picking faster and slower amounts to speed up or slow down this wave. And what that ends up looking like is this kind of distorted view. And we're gonna get a, a much nastier kind of sound. So there's the original sine wave carrier being distorted by the modulator. Pretty cool. If I uh, switch us back into sign mode, we get our tuning facility back. In any of these um, five options, modulator wave options on the, the lower row, uh, we lose the ability to tune them because they're all basically noise options. So it goes from the most low frequency centered uh, noise up to the highest frequency content based noise. The five options in the top row are all tuned. And so now I can increase or decrease the speed of the modulator, the frequency of the modulator. 
And what you'll find is that when FM is synced, uh, the modulator is operating at the same pitch or um, an octave multiple of the carrier. You get a much more harmonious sound. And the moment we deviate from that, it's going to sound far less harmonious. Immediately sounds dissonant. Seven is actually one of the more um, harmonious semitones because it's a perfect fifth. And then we go nasty again. And at 12, we've increased a whole octave and once again we sound more, I'm using terms like pleasant or harmonious, but it's all um, subjective. It depends on what your, you know, what your requirements are. Double click obviously gets us back to zero. Now that's linear frequency modulation. If I switch to exponential, things get wild real quick because now the modulator's frequency isn't being applied on a linear basis. Um, it's, it's exponential. And so at very small um, amounts of modulation, we get very dramatic uh, results. As opposed to much more kind of controlled. Okay, that's frequency modulation dealt with. Next door to it is phase modulation. And these two things are very, very closely linked. In fact, Yamaha's classic DX7 synth from the 80s actually employed phase modulation in its frequency modulation. Because when you do one of these things, you're effectively doing the other. The best way I can describe it is that if you increase the phase um, of a wave, you're basically moving it forwards in time. If you have a phase adjustment knob with a graphical interface on your synth, you can actually see that the waves shift forwards in time and a little bit of the tail appears at the front of the, of the previous wave. If it's moving forwards in relation to a fixed axis, then it's either being stretched or squashed. It's a little bit like, you know, the ambulance approaching you um, the pitch goes up as it's getting closer to you because it's squashing all of the air in between. Phase is the integral of frequency. So all of the individual changes of frequency over the period of time when it's being shift, they sum together to make the change of phase. And we can see it. If I switch to noise mode and increase the phase modulation, what's going to happen is that take that point there where my mouse is. If I move that wave forwards in time, I'm going to be playing a point here, which is louder. If I move it backwards in time, I'm going to be playing a point here, which is quieter. So if we focus on a single point on that curve and I increase phase modulation, what you're seeing there is a representation of that wave being jiggled forwards and backwards in time. Now, because our modulator is random noise, we have no idea whether or not it's going forwards or backwards. And so you get this kind of chaotic effect. And so you can still hear the original sine wave underneath, but it's been distorted. The big difference is that phase modulation, um, we can control the reset of phase. In other words, when the carrier wave starts being redrawn. Now at the moment, I'm in key mode. So I'll get us back into sine wave modulation because it's the simplest to, to represent and increase a little bit of uh, modulation. Sounds pretty well behaved. But the moment I switch to one of these other sync sources, it's much less well behaved. What's happening now is that the oscillator is now causing the phase of the carrier wave, the original wave, to be reset every time it gets back to zero. And what we get is a very um, kind of harsh sound. It's a similar effect with self retriggering, but this time the wave itself um, is controlling the rate of uh, reset. At the moment, those two things are the same. The carrier and the modulator are operating at the same pitch. So if I just hold a C down, they sound the same. And the fourth option, random, 
um, is to do with your key downs. So if I press lots of different keys down, each time I press the key, we're getting a random offset. As opposed to key retrig, where if I hit the same key, I'm going to get the same offset every time. Phase distortion is an extension of the concept of phase modulation. It's a very similar kind of thing again. It's an extension of the concept, but now it uses internal linear um, diagrams. We've got these six different um, phase targets, they're called. It's basically like an internal wave shape. They're hard synced to the carrier, which means they can never lose pitch. They're always like completely locked. The external modulator is still subject to its own controls. But as far as the phase distortion is concerned, see, as I increase this amount knob, depending on what shape I've got, so I've got skew set here, we're going to approach that wave shape. And at full amount, that is the skew target. So we've got all of these different wave shapes to define. And then once we've picked our phase distortion amount, we can then, and this is where brain explodes, you can then apply the, the secondary modulator to this amount. So if I pull this down a little bit and then introduce my modulator, this sine wave is now modulating the phase distorted wave. So let's put it in, let's go crazy. There we go. So that's white noise added to the original phase distortion shape. Phase distortion is a pretty uncommon method of modulation. I have been considering um, doing a video series on the Casio CZ, which is the most famous implementation of phase distortion, but they are few and far between. Finally, we've got wave folding. And what happens here is that when you get to a stage where you would be clipping, instead of clipping, the wave folds back on itself. So if I introduce an amount, you can see that Basically, imagine like the sine wave gets taken past its maximum point. Well, instead of hard clipping, it inverts and bends back on itself. So you'll see an increasingly large depression um, gets set into the wave and eventually it'll get so deep it'll bounce back on itself again. There we go. And then we fold back on ourselves again and again and again and we just keep going. We've got three different shapes that we can choose from. So this is wave folding according to a triangle. <laughs> and then this is some kind of weird hybrid shape. I don't really know what that's called. And then once you've configured your wave folding amount, again, you can introduce, let's get uh, another sine wave and add further sine wave modulation on top of our wave folding options. <laughs> Even though there's savage dark voodoo maths going on here, at the end of the day, all we really care about is what it sounds like. And so you'll use your ears to judge what the best type of modulation effect is. And of course, there's absolutely nothing stopping you having all four together. It's going to get increasingly chaotic if you do. But you know, chaos isn't always bad. And um, one final thing I've just realized I've not talked about these tuning modes. Uh, relative follows the tuning of the um, parent engine and absolute doesn't give a damn what the parent's tuning is. It will do its own thing. And finally, Hertz is an absolute value. You specify the exact number of cycles that the modulator will operate at. And so it's always going to sound dissonant unless you accidentally hit exactly the pitch of the key that you're playing. Cool. Where would sci-fi be without frequency modulation? <laughs>
Hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please hit the like button. I'll see you for the next one. Thanks a lot.